simply tell you the story of Stephen Carter. Stephen Carter, a young black boy who in the 1960s became the first, he and his family became the first black family to move into what had until then been an exclusively white neighborhood in Washington. And many years later, he writes about the story of that time. And he says, I and my brothers and sisters sat that first morning on the front doorstep to see how people would greet us. They didn't. They didn't even look at us. It was as if we weren't there. And I suddenly realized we should never have come here. We don't belong here. There is no life for us here. And while I was thinking those thoughts, my eye was caught by a lady the, opposite, the other side of the road, her arms laden with shopping. And when she saw us, she gave us a big smile. And then she had disappeared into her house just opposite. And five minutes later, came over with a big plate tray full of drinks and cookies and gave them to us and said, how wonderful to have you here. Welcome. Stephen said, that moment changed my life. I suddenly knew that I did belong here, that I did have a place here. Stephen, who is now professor of law at Yale University, tells this story in his book, Civility. And he says, it is probably no coincidence that that lady, her name was Sarah Kestenbaum. She died tragically young was an Orthodox Jewish lady because Jews have a word for this kind of thing. They call it chesed, which means kindness, especially to strangers, especially when it's hard. And I happen to be telling that story in the young Israel shul in Georgetown in Washington without even thinking. And the members of the shul came up to me afterwards and said, oh, did you know, Chief Rabbi, Sarah Kestenbaum was a member of this shul. We'd never heard that story before, but yes, that's the kind of thing Sarah used to do. Friends, I have to tell you, one act can change your life. One act can change your life. One of the really difficult experiences I went through, and maybe some of you went through it as well, was sitting shiva. Sitting shiva for my late father, Oliver Shalom. My late father had not an easy life. Came to Britain as a refugee as a young kid from Poland. Had to leave school at the age of 14 to help the family by earning a living. Never had an education, not Jewish, not secular. He spent his whole life in a little shop selling schmutters in London's East End. Wasn't an easy life for him. Never had any opportunity. When he died, and I sat Shiva, Rahman al-Islam, people, some of whom I hadn't seen for 50 years, some of whom I didn't recognize at all, would come up to me and tell me stories of kindness my father, Oliver Shalom, did, of favors, of help, of support. And I'm sure anyone who ever sat Shiva has had the same experience. And when I was hearing all these stories, I was inwardly weeping. I was thinking to myself, why did you wait till now? Why didn't you tell him that when he was still alive? If only he had known what he meant to you, maybe his life would have been a little easier. And then I suddenly realized that's how life is. You never really know how much of an impact your acts have on others, but they do. And the truth is the exact opposite of Shakespeare's Mark Antony, who said the evil men do, lives after them. The good is oft interred with their bones. The exact opposite is true. It is the good that we do that lives on after us, and it is the most significant thing that does. Friends, the good we do changes lives. The way... Sarah Kestenbaum changed Stephen Carter's life the way we all can change a life by one act of kindness or help or the kind word or a simple invitation to one who is lonely or a visit to alleviate the sufferings of someone who is sick or lift the distress of somebody who is sitting shiva rahman al-Islan. That changes lives. 
And I come back to the question with which I began. Why did God make the Jewish people so small? And the answer is because God wanted a people to know that every one of us counts. Every one of us matters. Every one of us can make a difference. And this I learned from David Baum. David, who changed so many lives, nonetheless went around telling this story, a famous story actually. It wasn't his own. He picked it up from an American anthropologist called Lauren Isley. But he made it his story. He, tells this, he used to tell everyone the story of an old man who's walking along a beach one day and he sees a young man surrounded by starfish that have been left stranded by the retreating tide and one by one the young man is picking up the starfish and throwing them back into the sea. And the old man looks at the young man and says, what are you doing, young man? Look at them. You can't save them all. And even if you were to save every single one of them on this beach, they're all the ones on the next beach and the next beach. You can't make a difference. And the young man looks at the starfish in his hand and throws it into the sea and says, to that one, I made a difference. And I have to tell you that I am very moved when Melinda Gates said, to me, knowing I altered one person's life for the better is the most important thing in my life. We should all be Melinda Gates. Here is a woman who gave away 43, she and her husband, Bill, have given away $43 billion to charity. But she still thinks and knows that the way we make a difference as David Baum made a difference, is one life at a time, one day at a time, and one act at a time. Not by accident did Judaism teach nefesh achat ha'olam malay. One life is like a universe. Therefore, if you can change one life for the better, you begin to change the universe. The world has suffering within it. And God says, I want you to be the people who don't accept that suffering, who go out and alleviate it, heal it, and make the world that is a little closer to the world that ought to be. And that is our challenge, our life. The world is God's question. And what we do with our lives is the answer. Friends, this has been quite a solemn speech so let me end with one of my favorite stories, which just tells us that whatever situation we are in, we can solve somebody else's problem if we try hard enough. This story is set in around 1947, when relations between the British and the Jewish population of Israel was not that great. I don't think I exaggerate there. The pre-state days. And there's a couple who made Aliyah, Chaim and Chenya. They live in a little moshav. And Chaim, who is running arms for the Haganah, gets caught by the British and sent to prison in the British prison in Akko. One day he receives a letter from his wife, Chenya, and says, Chaim, listen, it's all very good for you to go and be a hero for the Jewish people, but in the meantime, I'm left alone with our farm, and the time has come to plant potatoes, and how am I supposed to plow the ground on my own? Tell me, what am I supposed to do? Chaim sits down and writes Chenya a letter. Dear Chenya, whatever you do, don't touch the ground. There are rifles buried underneath. The letter is intercepted by the British military authorities. <laughs> the next day, the entire farm is overrun by British soldiers. They dig up every square inch of ground. They do not find one single rifle. Disconsolate, they return to base. The next day, Chaim writes to Chenya, Dear Chenya, now plant potatoes. Let's plant potatoes and heal the world. <laughs>